one could clearly uh, see that you know, Asia Pacific as an organization had a constituency beyond borders, beyond uh, yes. the yes. region. Around the year 2004, uh, I have become, I had uh, become involved with uh, the CEDAW process itself. Uh, Euro Asia Pacific set up in 1993, our own Global to Local, and the CEDAW review was 1997. But long before that, I was already familiar with the uh, CEDAW uh, review process. Um, and then around 2004, I began, I personally began to feel that I could switch sides. And there is a statement that I read, somebody else had written, that the, the government has to be assessed not on the basis of what they have done, but on the basis of what they have achieved. Mm. What they have done is very much no laws, policies, budgets, trainings. They, many governments are putting in all that. But what have we achieved? And the committee is also questioning them on that. They ask them if you've got these laws in place, what is the impact of it? So committee does ask that question. So this is, uh, and if there is no impact, where did the accountability fail? That is where it drops. They can tell you that nothing much or they say, yeah, 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 it has not been enforced. There hasn't been no impact. But where did it fail? Why was there no impact? What was the challenge? They don't go beyond that. So this is the kind of questioning that was critical to be asked. And this was my interest all the time. In your early years at, as a CEDAW committee member, um, you wrote a very important note. Uh, I expanded on the meaning of gender stereotyping. And that was uh, Korea, North Korea. Korea, right. That paragraph is still very critical. I go back and I look at it and to explain because they were banking on, but this is what women need. This is what women are supposed to be like. These are their needs. Uh, and I then explained to them, if you go use this framework of gender stereotyping, what are the implications for women? So the whole paragraph I wrote in the concluding observations. Uh, so this nuancing concepts is something I really, I did contribute to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And during your time the, uh, as a senior committee member, uh, you participated actively in the meeting of treaty bodies. Office of the High Commissioner's approach to the treaty body strengthening process is to highlight how logistically, how burdensome this uh, report writing is. Uh, that if a particular country has ratified two or three treaties, then they have to write uh, and if you take all the governments of the world um, in a in a year, there may be 200, 300. I don't know how many hundreds. I of uh, I don't know how many uh, reports that are being sent to Geneva, and so the Geneva Secretariat is burdened with having to process all this. Treaty bodies are burdened, and then concluding observations each treaty concluding observations running into 40, 50 concluding observations. So total number of concluding observations a country may receive is like going into 200, 300 concluding observations, combining all the treaties they have ratified. So it is very, very logistically burdensome. So what is the solution? Now, this is a fact. I'm not disputing this fact. This is a fact. But then if you have given this these figures and these statistics. My question then is, what is the solution to this? Uh, the solution that the Office of the High Commissioner and state party members who participate in this discussion are proposing is to reduce the reports, fewer reports, and for treaty bodies to give fewer concluding observations, 
there was at one time even a suggestion that there will be like one report if a country has ratified three treaties, one report combining all the three treaties, blah, blah, blah. But what I'm saying is you shouldn't look at it like that. You have to understand the purpose of the treaties and the ratification and the implementation and the reporting even. The re reporting is to give the government an idea of where the challenges are, where the gaps are, what the current situation is and what they should do next to improve the human rights situation. So you've got to take it from that angle. How do we improve the human rights situation in the country? Treaty body strengthening must focus on that. Uh, instead of paralyzing yourself by saying, oh, so many reports. Uh, if you take that approach, then Office of the High Commissioner has to go into selected countries that are doing badly, maybe, and give them the capacity to implement concluding observations well, effectively. So if they implement the conclusion and gather the data they need to implement the concluding observations, um, then the next report can be a shorter report because some of the articles of the treaty are already well implemented because the government has got the capacity and has got the data already and it doesn't have to write so much about that article. So the report can be shorter and the committee can give fewer concluding observations because some concluding observations are already being implemented well, no need to go into it anymore. So like that, gradually over time, you can reduce that burden. And the best aspect of this will be human rights situation in the country has improved. So that has taken place. And the other point I want to make also is that uh, you don't just look at it as human rights, which is separate from everything else that's happening in the country. Development in the country is also a human right. It has a human rights context. So if they gather data, they say it's so burdensome to gather this data. If you gather data, you need to gather that data to improve the economy in the country, to improve health in the country, to improve education in the country. You need baseline data. And that is part of your development program and policy. It's not just a treaty body obligation. Your treaty body obligation is synergistic with the well-being of the people in your country in every context. It's only an additional uh, framework that helps you be more sustainable in improving the well-being of your country, in giving a mandate to do this and a compulsion to do this. So if you implement your treaty obligations, you will be improving the well-being of your people in every aspect. And that is in the development areas, whatever those areas are. Uh, and therefore, you should see it like that and not just look at the logistics of report writing. And on top of which they have reduced the, that's the other burden, budget. Because every country is writing such long reports uh, that when it comes to the UN, these reports have to be reproduced. These reports have to be translated into five UN languages. So they're saying cannot. There's no more money to do all that. So they cut the budget. So they're asking for shorter reports. They're asking for shorter concluding observations. And they have cut the budget for technical assistance at the, at the international level. So even I feel the CERO committee is not getting enough money to meet more, to, uh, adjudic to, to look at the optional protocol cases. They are pending because they are not meeting enough. The request for uh, inquiry is pending. For example, because they, are, they cut the budget, uh, for example, my, uh, um, South Africa 
if I'm not mistaken, I'm not 100% sure about the dates, South Africa presented a request for, the women's groups presented a request for inquiry into domestic violence in South Africa, which is in spite of a domestic violence law, the law is not being implemented well, adequately, and prevalence of domestic violence unabated. So they wanted an inquiry into that. I think they presented that somewhere in 2012 or 11, that, that request. Committee was able to pick that up and sent an inquiry team only in 2018, six or seven years after the request came in because they had no money. UN has cut the budget. So this treaty body strengthening is cutting the budget, cutting staff, cutting technical assistance, reducing reports. And of course, state parties are happy to do this because they are participating very strongly in this with no leadership from the Office of the High Commissioner. I'm saying this openly. Hmm. I suppose the universal periodic review was meant to try and solve some of that. It's not. It's not resolving that. Mm. What are your and views on that? Universal, if, if you take Malaysia and the Universal Periodic Review, in, my, in one way, governments are taking more interest in the Universal Periodic Review than in their treaty body obligations. Yeah, uh, Because it's one report. Mm. They can touch on everything. They don't have to write three reports if they've ratified three treaties. At the national level, uh, and I'm only speaking for Malaysia, I don't know the situation in other countries. At the national level, uh, NGOs are forming a coalition uh, to do something like a shadow report, yeah, to bring, in the, bring up the issues. And in Malaysia, I find that women's groups do not seem to have a strong enough voice in this NGO coalition to raise all the issues that they want to raise. See, uh, and this is very worrying because if, and once the universal periodic review is heard, it's a review by peers, yeah? And of course, more than a hundred recommendations are given under the universal periodic review, but the Universal Periodic Review gives an option to the government to identify which recommendations they will accept and implement and which they have noted and which they are not going to implement. So what's the use? They have that option of saying we are not going to implement. The ones that they say they will implement, there isn't a clear follow-up. I'm talking for Malaysia. There isn't, uh, there are meetings, Ministry of Foreign Affairs takes the lead. Uh, they call for NGO meetings. Process-wise, everything seems hunky-dory. They meet with NGOs, but I don't see clear implementation. Depends on the politics in the country. Like if you take Malaysia, everything is in a mess. Within three years, we've had three prime ministers. So this, these human rights issues are of the least concern. So there's nothing to compel them to implement even the periodic review uh, recommendations, but very critical ones have been thrown out. The government is saying we will not uh, uh, we will not implement. So I am not having too much uh, faith uh, even in the periodic review. I just feel you need stronger leadership at the UN level where all this is concerned mm. uh, to push for certain things. Mm. I don't necessarily see that happening as much as I would like to. And I don't see 
NGOs coming together very strongly on the uh, from the national uh, the treaty body strengthening process is still being discussed but there's an international team of NGOs that are participating in that and these international team of NGOs in my view are not people who have their feet on the ground and are actually dealing with uh, inequality issues or non-discrimination issues at the national level. They are high-flying international people. So people who are actually working, doing shadow reports under the treaties at the national level should participate more strongly in the treaty body strengthening process. We, we are not doing it. Well, I, I don't want to be too critical about this because for national level NGOs, just dealing with national issues of inequality itself is so overwhelming for them. And then countries like India, I don't know about Bangladesh, what the situation is. This uh, trying to get funding, the government is blocking every avenue of funding for them. Uh, and they are under threat all the time. Uh, you know, of being monitored. Uh, I don't know when they'll, some of them will get arrested. So under these kind of conditions, what, how can you expect uh, civil society also to function very effectively? It's, it's a very bad period of time all around for human rights. Globally, it's a bad time globally. Um, because we now have uh, this new form of government called elected dictatorships. <laughs> see, see, that is why I feel national level NGOs are being more and more disempowered, you know, either through threats or by cutting off their funding or whatever. Or just but, not listening. Yeah, but I feel if we can have strong regional level NGO groups that can uh, channel funds, uh, that can provide leadership conceptually, strategy-wise, how to move, how to push for certain things, um, and look at a platform of equality and non-discrimination, as you mentioned earlier, Shireen, not just go into a thematic approach some of the regional NGOs are just doing that thematic approach. They're looking now at um, World Bank, they're looking at IMF and the global neoliberal economy. How is it affecting everybody? I'm not saying those are not important. But what those global institutions, the damage they are doing has to be brought down to the level of the question of inequality on the ground. What is happening to women on the ground? Uh, and how to understand that there is discrimination regardless of the economy of the country being better. Mm. Because of neoliberal economy, your GDP has improved. Doesn't matter. Inequality still exists. You know, and there is intergenerational inequality. People are not just poor today. They were come from families that were poor to previous generation also was poor. And that intergenerational poverty is exacerbating and compounding the poverty of this generation. And coupled with gender ideology, at the same time, poverty and gender ideology. I don't know if you all heard that um, Malaysian women's groups, uh, the Joint Action Group for Gender Equality did a, a women's tribunal. You yes. heard about the women's, yes. the women's tribunal? I was one of the judges. And one of the things that really uh, touched my heart was a case study of a young woman who comes from this background of what I call intergenerational poverty. I don't know where the father is. There's no father in the picture. 
The mother is poor, can hardly make ends meet, and she's got four or five children. This particular woman who came and testified with us was uh, in school. She went, because school is free, no? Uh, uh, there's no school fees and all that. She was going to school. At the age of 13, her elder brother had so much um, power within the family of decision making that he stopped her from going to school. He said, no need for you to study anymore. She was only 13. Took her, pulled her out of school and made her go and work as a, in a factory. So there now she's pushed into child labor at the age of 13. And she's very unhappy in her home because the brother controls everything. The mother is helpless. They hardly have any food to eat in the house. And in this factory for two years, she worked at the age of 15, there was a security guard who proposed to her and she married him. This was a way of getting out of this difficult family situation. The minute she got married to him, he started beating her up. And she started having many children. Early pregnancy, frequent pregnancy, domestic violence, blah, blah. And then he did not provide any support for the five children. She had a brother-in-law who coerced and deceived her into taking up sex work. So she went into sex work. And I'm not saying anything about the rightness or the wrongness of sex work. But she described a great deal about the abuses she faced while she was doing sex work because she was so powerless and the police would constantly harass the sex workers. Now the government on the other hand is doing poverty eradication programs. So I'm saying in the development, Malaysia's five year development plans is a big chapter on poverty eradication. I said poverty eradication has to be assessed from the perspective of is the program able to lift women out of the cycle of poverty. So and poverty is not unidimensional, not just lack of income. The, mm. the, the assumption is lack of income. So we give them income generation. Poverty is multidimensional. It is not only lack of, it's lack of decision making, it's lack of any kind of uh, decision making capacity, uh, lack of assets, nothing, to, no social safety network, no health situation is poor. Uh, there are so many elements that's contributing. Huh? So this that, lack one, that one case study sums up actually everything, almost everything that you and I and Madhu and all of us have been trying to fight against. So um, on that note, let's just try and finish now. You have spent most of your life as a warrior, basically, <laughs> as a warrior fighting against discrimination and inequality and fighting for women's rights and dignity. What, you know, if you were to reflect for a moment, what would you, what would you say now in looking towards the future? I want to tell you, you see, people sometimes ask me a, a slightly different question. They ask me, yeah, same thing. You have done so much work on equality, discrimination. Can you tell us what's your biggest victory? What do you think really changed because uh, you did all this work? And it's for me a very, very difficult question to answer. What changed? What uh, what? Well, a lot of law reform has taken place, of course. Uh, domestic violence law and violence law exists in many countries. Is this a gain? Is it a victory? I don't know. But uh, what I want to explain is, you know, when I went, uh, this is such a long time ago, when I went and did the, um, my master's in Sussex on gender and development, and that was 1991, 92, or 91, actually. It's, uh, what? How many years ago was 30 that? 30 years ago. 30, yeah? Uh, is it 30 years? Yeah. 31 years? 
31 years. Yes. When I finished that gender and development course, I was still in London. I forget in whose house I was. I was with, in somebody's house. Zaina, with Zaina, no? I visited you. I don't know. No, 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 no. I lived with the, well, not where I lived. This was like a dinner I went to, to somebody's house. Oh. And they had this, you know, there is this Chinese uh, predicting the future uh, method called I Ching, I Ching, I Ching or something. Remember I Ching it's called? I Chi, I Chi. So they open a page and then they ask you to ask a question. Now they don't open a page first. They ask you to ask a question that you want answered. And then I don't know how they open a particular page. And whatever is written on that page is the answer to your question. It's completely random. So when it came to my turn, I asked the question, I've just finished this master's in gender and development. I had no job. I had resigned from APWLD, but I was hoping APWLD will take me back. But there was some maneuvering and I was not taken back. But at that time, I didn't know. I uh, asked the question, after doing this master's in gender and development, is it useful for me to go back into women's rights work or not? Will it be successful? If I, will I do anything useful if I go back into women's rights work or should I do something else? Then that page was opened for me, whichever page that I should read and understand. You know what it said? That well, a paragraph. And it said, you look, there's a mountain, a high mountain in front of you. And you see clearly the contours of that mountain. Every day you get up and you look at the contours of the mountain and it looks the same today. It was the same tomorrow. It looks the same day after tomorrow. It looks the same. The mountain doesn't seem to have changed if you look at it day by day by day. But after five years, you don't see the mountain. You go back and see the mountain and you will see how the winds and the elements have been washing over that mountain and the contours of the mountain have changed. Only if you look at the mountain five years later or 10 years later even. That's what it said. Now, what would you interpret as an answer to my question? You tell me. <laughs> 30 years. The question, the, I was quite happy with that answer because what I felt it was telling me was don't look for immediate changes in the work you do. Tomorrow, women's situation will still be the same as it was yesterday or as it was day before yesterday. You have to see it in perspective. Many years down the road, something would have changed. So my answer to your question, what would I tell people? I will say, if you believe that you have to work towards equality and that is a goal, a vision, keep working on it. And don't look for an immediate change or something that you will get tomorrow because you worked on this. You can't, you can't. So that is my answer. Shanti, just listening to you and hearing about uh, all that you have been through and all that you have done has been such a both a pleasure, but also so enriching, so enriching. And, you know, uh, hats off. I just want to say hats off. You are uh, an example. You are a model. You are a mentor. You are, uh, a, the kind, you are the kind of warrior that I want to see the, in the next generation. Thank you, Shanti. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for your kind words. <laughs>